disseminate what we are doing through webinars and this kind of activity is, is a true reality. And I think that we, we say in Portuguese, from the lemon to the lemonade, we are trying to, uh, to go to many countries all over the world and uh, much better than, than if we didn't do it by, by Zoom or, yes. or other platforms. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about what we are doing uh, related to endometriosis and infertility. But first of all, and uh, Olarek is following me in many situations all over the world. It's a, it's a big pleasure to meet you in many, many meetings that I attend. And, uh, but uh, as you know, Olarek, I, I, I'm going to challenge the attendees here with some new concepts about the disease, okay? Yes. So let me share my screen here. Yes, okay, now I can see your screen. Okay. So, uh, let's, let's talk about uh, infertility and endometriosis, but you know that uh, we cannot, we have to, to talk a little bit about uh, pain as well, because for us to decide uh, in terms of what to do with infertile patients, we need to consider those one with pain or without pain. So I'm trying to address my lecture here, uh, talking about the new definitions of endometriosis, some aspects of the epidemiology, because we, we know that when we think about infertility, we need to consider these situations. Uh, briefly, I'll talk about the classification, the diagnosis and the treatment of the disease. So first of all, uh, the classic criteria for us to to, to talk about endometriosis, there is many pathologies all over the world, I don't know uh, if in Thailand is the same, uh, is they require the presence of glands for the diagnosis, the pathologic diagnosis of the disease. And uh, for years, we, we think that this concept needs to be changed because uh, stroma is even more important than the glands. So this is why when we talk about the disease, we consider the presence of glands and or stroma outside of the uterus for us to diagnose endometriosis. So this is the first aspect. The, and, the, and the actual criteria involves the presence of the stroma and in parallel, the presence of the Millerian epithelium with stroma, with a, a, a hemorrhage and, fi and fibrosis, and express it with the, the, with the cytoplasmatic expression of CO, uh, COX-2, that is very interesting for us to consider. But more recently, this paper from Paola Viganò uh, even challenged us more than before, because the proposal in this publication in the Human Reproduction, this is an opinion paper, what I completely agree is that it's time to redefine endometriosis, including its profibrotic nature. And this is very important, mainly because the key messages of this opinion paper is that fibrosis must receive more attention as a potential targets of medical treatments for the disease. Animal models should present fibrosis and the definition, including fibrosis, may have implications, not only clinical, but also diagnostic implications. So it's important for us to mention this because sometimes, for example, we are doing a surgery for a patient with a, a big endometriotic nodule involving the bowel and the pathologist, sometimes it's hard to, see, to find glands and stroma. And uh, a good pathologist would measure the fibrosis and try to find glands and stroma. But more important than this, in the future, I believe that to treat the fibrosis is much more important than to treat glands and stroma. And this is important for us to talk about endometriosis and pain, endometriosis and infertility, and mainly for patients with endometriosis and uh, deep endometriosis, as I'm going to, to talk about this.
right? So, following this uh, information, well, another important issue for us to address here is that there was a big change on the knowledge of the endometriosis starting from 1990, mainly because this is when Cornille in Belgium described the deep disease. And after this, there are strong epidemiologic evidence showing that 10 to 15% of women in reproductive ages may have endometriosis. More than 1 billion and 700 patients uh, all over the world between 15 and, and 49 years may have the disease according to the World Bank population project tables. And for sure, uh, most of this woman uh, needs a nice, a good diagnosis and a good treatment for the disease. Another important thing when we consider the epidemiology is that the time elapsed from the onset of the symptoms to the diagnosis of the disease is long. We published a paper in, in uh, uh, some years ago in 2003 showing that uh, the mean time from all patients is seven years. And sometimes the patient C may go to several doctors to have her diagnosis, sometimes more than five, right? Another thing is that when the patient starts the symptom when she's younger, this time elapsed is even larger, is even bigger. That is in, in important for us to, to consider. And of course, it's not that big if the patient goes to, to her diagnosis after 30 years old. And if the patient is infertile, that is important here, the time elapsed tends to be smaller because of the, all of the, diagnose, the, the diagnostic methods that she tend to use for, for, for her to achieve her dream of being pregnant. So this is a very important issue because we are talking about how to decide, how to treat, how to diagnose the disease that want to be pregnant. And another important thing that is part of my story in Brazil, right? I work uh, in, a, in two hospitals here. I work in the Sao Paulo University. Sao Paulo University uh, is the main university of uh, Latin America in the, all of the, the grades that uh, we, we see being published uh, in the last years. But more important than this, right? We have a hospital that is a huge hospital. So imagine that when I started working with endometriosis, uh, one important thing that happened here was that the, this, the lines for surgery were very long. So this is why we try to work hard towards the non-invasive diagnosis of the disease. So that is very important for us to think about the, the endometriosis. Another important thing for us is to mention that when we talk about endometriosis, we may be talking about three different diseases. We may be talking about superficial, ovarian, and deep disease. That sometimes they coexist, but not all the times they coexist. And for sure, as I mentioned before, after 1990, when Cornell published in, in the fertility sterility, this paper, the description of deep endometriosis changed the way for us to to diagnose and to treat the disease. Of course, if we go back to many studies, uh, even from Samson uh, in the beginning, in the 100 years ago, we are going to see situations that are very similar to deep endometriosis, but the formal description came uh, in uh, 1990 in this paper that is very relevant, right? So we need to consider these three different diseases and the idea of the three diseases came in 1999, uh, 1999 when uh, Michel Nizol and Jacques Donnet uh, published this paper in the Fertility Sterility. But now we know that we are not talking about rectovaginal septum disease, that is a very specific part of the deep endometriosis. We are talking about deep endometriosis, right? Another thing, important thing, is uh, when we, we discuss the pain and infertility, 
we for sure we know that uh, there are many inflammatory uh, paths for us to justify the pain including the macrophages in the peritoneal fluid the increased levels of tnf alpha in the peritoneal fluid and also some internal kinds like one six and eight there is another uh, immunoreactivity increased intense for ngf right the nerve growth factor that probably is something that justify this the the presence of pain in patients with deep endometriosis there is a, a, a release of some prostaglandins like e2 and f and increased numbers of mast cells near the endometriotic lesions that also may justify the disease so this is uh, completely relevant and we know that uh, uh, when we talk about infertility this is a different scenario if we talk about infertility we know that uh, in, in this evaluation of almost uh, 800 cases of endometriosis from our service uh, if we consider all cases of endometriosis we may be talking about 56 percent of prevalence of infertility when we we consider the 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 presence of deep endometriosis this prevalence is even higher is 65 percent and when we talk about the absence of deep endometriosis the prevalence of infertility is a little bit lower so this is important for us to mention uh, before going ahead and, and discussing the diagnosis and the treatment of the disease passing by an important issue that is the classification of the disease right uh, we we know that and, and even uh, our team published uh, two years ago a strong paper uh, mentioning that endometriosis uh, classification needs to be improved even because uh, there are many many situations like this one right look look to this patient here she's she's been submitted to a laparoscopy and uh, considering the diagnostic laparoscopy what can we see here there is a lesion behind the uterus in a diagnostic laparoscopy is difficult to precise the depth of the lesion if it in, involves the bowel or not but if we classify and the patient is very symptomatic as you can see uh, in, the, in this slide here if we use the 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 AS, asrm classification here we are going to say that probably she has a three centimeters uh, lesion here uh, deep right and she's this patient will have this score four and stage one disease of course this patient had a pre-op diagnosis of the disease and we knew before that uh, using the ultrasound that we do here we knew before that she has a huge nodule compromising the bowel so we started doing the procedure as you can see here we started the procedure through the pararectal spaces right and here you can see the rectum and this lesion that is very relevant and it justify the pain that she has so of course in many situations uh, here we are doing a shaving as you can see here we are reducing the lesion but uh, in sometimes a disc resection is needed according to the the end of this presentation here so again uh, it's time for us to have a new classification and this is why uh, a classification considering deep endometriosis is being uh, done by AGL, right we did a tabulation system uh, involving 30 specialists from all over the world uh, trying to ask them to rank from 0 to 10 different sites of the disease right peritoneal ovarian and deep, deep, deep endometriosis in different sites right and then these colleagues from all over the world sent us the ranking for this and we performed this distribution uh, the proposed new classification uh, showing that we have a, a new four stage system but straight to the point not not for example in the agl uh, classification we have 40 points if she has a coup de sac obliteration and because of these 40 points in that classification many cases of deep disease uh, are included in this 
this uh, rank uh, from a ASRM classification. In the AGL, no. In this new classification, we can see that we have uh, different sites uh, ranked properly, right? And then we validated at that time the, the, this classification according to the scores of pain, surgical difficulty, as you can see here, four levels of surgical difficulty. If the surgery is much easier than the, the more complex disease, that is the bowel involvement. And, and then we, we observed that uh, the, both stages, both classifications uh, are different, as you can see here. And then we evaluated the, how linear are both classifications. And this new system is much more, there is a linear fashion as you can see here, for patients with infertility, right? Uh, linear fashion as well for patients with uh, pain, more linear than ASRM. And also when we see the surgical difficulty is also much more linear as you can realize here, right? Uh, comparing the new system and the ASRM system. So just to reinforce that the, the goal of this for us is to develop an app and for us to, fi to finalize the surgery, being able to classify the disease properly and to send the information uh, for the, the, the data of the patient for us to try to, 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 to give the best uh, orientation for these patients, right? And now in, in the, the second part of this, this discussion here, I'm going to talk about diagnosis and the treatment of the disease. We know that, as I discussed before, we need to think more about the disease when the patient has pain, right? And this is the paper that I mentioned before that was published in 2003, right? Just uh, reinforcing that we have six symptoms that we need to ask the patients, right? Starting from what we call in Portuguese the 6D, uh, the, the dysmenorrhea, uh, chronic pelvic pain, uh, infertility, dyskesia, dysuria, and dyspareunia, deep dyspareunia. And we know, uh, looking for this study that we published before, that patients with deep endometriosis tends to have uh, more pain and even more infertility than patients with other uh, types of the disease. So, this is relevant. The other uh, part of the diagnosis is the markers, and we still don't have a good marker for the diagnosis of the disease. We, in, in, a, in, the, the, in the 90s, we tried to work with different markers. We, even this study that we published more than 20 years ago, showed that the CA-125 was the best marker at, at that time and uh, it needed to be measured during the first three days of the menstrual cycle. And uh, we, we don't have, after this, we don't have any, any revolution in this field, right? No, no other markers that may be helpful for the diagnosis of the disease. Even this study that we are preparing uh, to publish, we, we did this study with MIT, uh, with uh, Linda Griffith showing that uh, using a Luminex platform, evaluating many different interleukines, we, we saw that there is uh, uh, some interleukines like interleukine 8 that may, be, uh, may participate on the diagnosis of the disease, but unfortunately, uh, we still don't have the marker of the disease. And this is another case that I want to show you, right? This is another patient with a deep endometriosis that this patient came to me showing this laparoscopy that she did before, right? She did a laparoscopy and what the colleague, uh, the gynecologist that treated her, that probably is not a specialist, he saw that lesion and he coagulated the tip of the iceberg, right? You can see here the lesion, uh, the rectum is attached. So the, his decision was to to use the bipolar and to coagulate the tip of the iceberg. The patient came to me after three months with a lot of pain and trying to, to look for a second opinion. And then we did 
the ultrasound that we do here, as you can see here, there is a hyperchoic lesion compromising the muscularis of the rectum. Now it's easy to, to see the lesion here, right? And uh, with this exam, uh, we can define many other aspects of the disease, right? Like the depth of the disease, the size, the longitudinal size of the disease, the circumference of the bowel that is compromised here, you can see the lesion and the bowel here, she has more than uh, between 30 and 40% of the circumference compromised, right? So we decided to do a real surgery. And when we, this is my surgery, when, but now not exploring the pelvis without a pre-op diagnosis. And uh, what we did was to find the lesion, opening the pararectal spaces, as you can see here, right? And uh, finding the lesions, we decided to remove the lesions here. We are using a diode laser for this purpose. What is not uh, uh, essential, but uh, it may be helpful uh, for, for, for us to, to define precisely the, the depth of the lesion, right? And then after identifying the lesion compromising the rectum, first we resected that lesion. And then you can see here that after this procedure, this shaving, we, this is the mucosa here, we uh, placed a stitch there to, to try to uh, close the muscularis, as you can see here. So this is the, the end of the procedure, but what is very relevant, right? We need a pre-op diagnosis for the disease. We cannot consider the diagnostic laparoscopy anymore because we have, uh, it's possible for us to use the imaging methods that we have nowadays to make a good diagnosis and to recommend a good surgery for the patient. So this is the end of the procedure. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is some publications from our group, starting from this one. This is a, a publication from 2007 in the human reproduction, when we compared the clinical exam, the transvaginal exam, and the MRI for the diagnosis of deep endometriosis. What we saw in this study, that the sensitivity of the ultrasound, the transvaginal ultrasound, with a very simple bowel preparation is of 98% for when the bowel is compromising. When we use MRI, it's lower, it's 83%. And for the retrocervical endometriosis, the sensitivity is 95% and the MRI is 76%. So this, is, this was the beginning of the statement that many other authors started to, to consider that the method for us to have a good imaging diagnosis is a transvaginal ultrasound made by a good specialist. In Brazil and in many other centers that we train it, we do an ultrasound with a very simple bowel preparation. This bowel preparation is, includes uh, an enema one hour before the exam for, for us to allow the radiologist to see better the layers of the rectum, the retrocervical endometriosis, the rectovaginal septum, and so on. And we also uh, recommend the patient to use two, uh, two pills of uh, uh, laxative, like Ducolax or something like this, at 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. in the day before the exam. So when we do this recommendation, we have better results for us to diagnose the right iliac fossa, like the ilium, the appendix, and the cecum, compromised by the disease. So this was the first study. We have many citations of this study, and many other studies came from our groups and from our colleagues working with us, uh, even showing that we can use the ultrasound uh, to improve the other details of the disease. In this study here, we show it that we can define the layers of the rectum compromised by the disease. And this is a very important information because the deeper is the lesion, the, the circumference of the rectum 
is is bigger so if we are going to decide uh, between for example uh, a disc resection and a segmental resection of the rectum the depth of the lesion and the layers compromised may be an important information and you you can see here that uh, it's possible for us to see a normal rectum uh, looking for the mucosa that is a thin layer the submucosa that is the the clear layer like white the muscularis that is divided by a very thin white layer in a deeper muscularis uh, in an inner layer of the muscularis and the outer layer of the muscularis and the serosa of the rectum so uh, this is the exam as i showed in that uh, surgery before we can see another case of uh, uh, probably 35 percent of the circumference compromised and we can measure the longitudinal diameter for us to define if this patient is going to be submitted to surgery, what kind of procedure should be done, right? So this is very relevant and uh, uh, for us to consider uh, the treatment of the disease. And uh, in this study, we, we saw that it's possible to define the number of lesions, the depth of the lesion, the layers compromised by endometriosis and, and, and other information that the ultrasound can provide us in a very precise mode. So uh, the, our pre-surgical workup includes a good clinical exam, the CA-125 during the three days of the menstrual cycle may be helpful but it's not that relevant. If we're going to exclude one exam, I would exclude the CA-125 and the transvaginal ultrasound with bowel preparation. If this patient, this exam, the transvaginal ultrasound is normal, we consider that the patient doesn't have endometriosis or she has early endometriosis in the early stages, peritoneal disease. If this exam is conclusive, she will be treated. And if we have questions about the ovary, we recommend MRI. Questions about the rectum or the rectovaginal septum, only in situations like this, we recommend a transrectal ultrasound. But just for you to know, uh, the last transrectal ultrasound that I recommended was uh, three to four years ago in a patient without sexual intercourse that was not able to be submitted to a transvaginal ultrasound. And if we have questions about the urinary tract, we recommend a Euro MRI or uh, orography for this purpose. And to conclude, some tips about the treatment. And again, we need to, to divide the treatment of patients with pain, pain and infertility, and just infertility. And for this, the, in the clinical evaluation, we consider the visual analogic scale to try to have a cutoff of seven, right? That uh, we, 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 we consider that seven is important because pain more than seven, the impact of the, on the quality of life is much bigger, much higher, right? So if the, after a good evaluation, if she has an abnormal ultrasound, right? And symptoms, surgery should be recommended for patients with pain. If she has a normal ultrasound, right, and uh, uh, if the ultrasound is normal, uh, she can be submitted to a clinical treatment for pain. And if it fails after six months, as she didn't have signs of deep endometriosis, we may recommend a microlaparoscopy. That is a procedure that we do a lot for cases like this. I just did. Um, um, microlaparoscopy before this lecture now. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's very good the, for the patient is, is a three millimeter trocar. Uh, we, didn't, we don't need to suture. And the, the precision of the new instruments is very good. Even the bipolar is, is very interesting. And when we use the diode laser, that is a laser with fiber, as you saw here, uh, it, it goes in the in the stroke are very well with an instrument of three millimeters. So this is important for us for patients with pain. 
Uh, when we think about the clinical treatment, we have many uh, alternatives. Most of them that will treat not the disease, will treat the symptom. And this is very important, right? Clinical treatment is good for the symptom. Uh, we, we cannot expect the reduction of the endometriosis using clinical treatment. And there are some authors like Chapron, for example, that even they published, his group published a very nice study showing that sometimes if we use uh, oral contraceptive, for example, the delay of the diagnosis may compromise the patient because the, patient, the pain is lower, right? And sometimes uh, the, the progress of the lesion uh, occurs. And of course, uh, it's not a good benefit for the patient. And we have, of course, new alternatives coming, right? Uh, not talking about uh, uh, hormones, but talking about other things, right? Statins or antioxidants and uh, drugs to treat fibrosis that we think that is the future of the treatment of the disease. I, I was part of this publication in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, two years ago using elagolics that is a generation uh, 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 antagonist without a flare-up uh, for the treatment of patient with pain. But again, not to reduce the lesion, but to treat the symptom of the patient. And there is another thing that is important when the bowel is compromised by the disease. So again, in the, 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 the algorithm uh, the propedeutic algorithm and therapeutic algorithm will consider the clinical symptoms, the transactional ultrasound with the bowel preparation, and if the patient has deep endometriosis compromise in the bowel and the, pa the pain is relevant, more than seven, we decide about the surgery, surgical treatment uh, according to the involvement of the rectum. If she has uh, a unique nodule with less than three centimeters, we can do a nodule resection. And for this purpose, we perform a nodule resection with a, a disc excision using a circular stapler. So you can see here that we identify the lesion, we place a stitch in the lesion, right? You can see here that the lesion uh, has uh, probably three centimeters of length, right? And then we uh, place the circular stapler in the rectum and we put the lesion inside the circular stapler to try to minimize the disease uh, in, the, in the rectum. So there is a very precise information. And as you can see here, the result is very good, right? We remove the lesion through the rectum using this technique. And again, if the, the, the disease is bigger than three centimeters or multifocal and the patient has pain, the segmental resection uh, may be recommended. We are doing uh, less and less segmental resection. We, we know that uh, the more conservative that we can do, uh, it's better for the patient. We need to know uh, precisely uh, the anatomy. We need to start identifying the left ureter, and then we go to the Okabayashi space, trying to find even the, the the hypogastric nerves, right? And trying to damage these nerves to avoid the worst complication in situations like this, okay? Is that the function of the bladder and the bowel, right? And then we open a four centimeter lesion in the right iliac fossa, trying to finalize the procedure, as you can see here, and doing after this the, the anastomosis using the circular stapler. So this is what we do routinely after a pre-op diagnosis. So the key is the pre-op diagnosis. And there is another important thing, that sometimes the patient doesn't have a relevant pain and doesn't have a disease that is at risk because it's not uh, obstructing the bowel or the ureter. So in situations like this, we can do a clinical treatment following the patient, it's important, it's very relevant that we need to follow the patient by ultrasound and clinical exam in the first year uh, every three months and then if there is an increase of the disease uh, or uh, the pain uh, doesn't uh, 
or, or increase of the pain, uh, she can be submitted to surgery uh, using the same criteria of the, 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 the other side of this slide here. So this is very relevant uh, for us to consider. Another important uh, situation is when we focus on specifically on infertility. This is our algorithm that I, I, I want you to, to understand in details what we, we, we try to organize with the patient. So we, again, we start evaluating the pain and infertility. And then we perform a transaction ultrasound with bowel preparation. In parallel, we evaluate the ovarian reserve, meaning that uh, using an ultrasound to count the, the follicles and during the, the beginning of the menstrual cycle and an uh, evaluation of the anti milladian hormone is very relevant. Uh, last week, I did a surgery for a, a 23 years old patient with an anti milladian hormone of 0 0.13. She wants to be pregnant in the future. So we need to look for the ovarian reserve, even for patients with less than 30 years old, because uh, the gynecologist, the specialist on endometriosis, needs to talk about cryopreservation uh, before recommending the surgery. So in situations like this, when the patient is, the, the, the pain is not, uh, the patient, the pain is, is lower than seven in the visual analogic scale. No bowel obstruction, no ureteral obstruction. If the tubo, uh, there is a normal tubo patency, we may start for cases like this to be in a very cons uh, conservative manner to do an uh, ovulation induction. If there is uh, a fail in three to six months, we go to IVF and just realizing that we are not recommending surgery in cases like this because she doesn't have a lot of pain and we may start with a more conservative uh, treatment. But if she has a relevant pain or bowel obstruction or ureteral obstruction or two IVF failures in the other group, as I mentioned before, we, we tend to decide about the treatment uh, regard, uh, considering the ovarian reserve. If she has more than 30 years old or a low of anti malarian hormone, less than two, for example, we need to recommend cryopreservation, followed by surgery and then embryo transfer. So this is what we do when the ovarian reserve tends to be low in situations like this, or there are two IVF failures uh, for that, those patients without symptoms. And if she has a normal ovarian reserve, less than 30 years old, surgery may be recommended before the induction of the ovulation, if the, there is a normal tubal patency uh, or IVF, depending on the situation. So this is very important for us to move ahead and to decide properly uh, about what to do, right? Just to, to finalize, I have a few slides showing that this type of uh, algorithms uh, was validated in some other studies. And I, this is a, a multicentric study with uh, uh, authors from all over the world. You can see here Felice Petralia from Italy, Tommaso Falcone from the US, uh, York Eckstein from Austria, Yutaka Osuga from Japan, and Charles Chapron from France. We defined it, we submitted, and we, we published this study in the Human Reproduction Update, showing that exactly what I mentioned before, right? We need to look for the pain, the characteristics of the bowel compromised by the disease, and the presence of infertility or not, right? Uh, to try to use this algorithm to decide that if we do a surgery, we need to go to what I, I call a one-shot surgery, right? Uh, we need to do a surgery, trying to not repeat another surgery after this. When we read in the literature, uh, we can see that the, the percentage of patients that 
may be submitted for more than one surgery when they have endometriosis is uh, 40 to 50 percent. I completely disagree. This is not our experience with more than, than 2,000 patients submitted to surgery uh, by our team. Our, uh, what we see, what we do is to do a good pre-op exam, is to plan properly and to follow algorithms, right? Of course, defining the best treatment for the patient, right? And of course, the conclusion of this is that when we treat properly, we tend to increase the quality of life of this patient, right? As, we, this, as you can see in this publication, right? That there is a significant improvement in pain-related symptoms when uh, she's submitted to the correct surgery in the right moment for this purpose. So this is very important. And, uh, and uh, to conclude, I wanna thank you, Olarik, for, for this invitation, right? For all of this, of your group there. And I, I want to advertise this meeting that is going to be in a few months, in a few days, right? September 17 to 19. Uh, uh, we, it's going to be from uh, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. in Sao Paulo. That means that uh, now for us is 10.47 a.m. So just, I think that you have a- 10 hours, 10 hours. 10, 10 hours, so it's, it's not that bad because it will finish at midnight your, your, your time there. But uh, we are going to have uh, the, the main days of the meeting is uh, Friday, September 18, and Saturday, September 19. And uh, Mark Posover is going to do a live surgery. Mario Malzoni is going to do a live surgery. I am going to do a live surgery. Chapron is, is going to give a keynote lecture. Shailesh Putambecker, that you know, is going to do a cadaveric dissection, right? And other things, there will be a, a part of this, this uh, mix uh, event uh, focus on urogynecology as well. So John Delance will be there. Uh, the president of Ayuga, uh, Henny Thakkar is going to, to teach and other colleagues, more than 30 international faculties that probably you know most of them, right? Uh, that is very relevant. So again, the website, as you can see here, is mix.med.br. You can see there, you can check the language in English, and, uh, and it's going to be in English uh, translated to Portuguese or Portuguese translated to English. But we tend to, to do the, the meeting in English to be, uh, for us to be able to, to, to have people from all over the world. So uh, it's important. Uh, Olaric, uh, for you to help me to publicize this because it's a unique meal, yeah. very, very inexpensive, right? I'm going to, to send you the, the piece of this meal. So uh, it will be nice to have you there. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very for a very informative lecture. Actually, I will go to Sao Paulo as, you, as you, uh, we talk. Uh, yes, I invited you. But, but you know that uh, now it's COVID era, right? It's very difficult to, uh, to travel. So actually I want to visit uh, the Sao Paulo in next month, but it's very difficult, no, I, so I can't. Mm -hmm. Let's plan for next year. Next year, next year. I think everything is much better next year. So, uh, and we have, I think we have some, uh, Audience would like to discuss, uh, Doctor Kitawi, what do you think for uh, about the endometriosis and infertility? Say again. Doctor Kitawi is here. Is my colleague. He is uh, infertility treatment. Yes, thank you, Professor, thank you. for your lecture. Can Can you hear me? I'm, I'm not sure. Hello. Very well. Yeah, yeah, but but um, I have some question about uh, in the aspect of the infertility patient. I have the the patient she she uh, thirty two years old and then she uh, 
uh, do the surgery for right SO, right orient uh, ophorectomy for uh, about the the endometri the endometrioma, and then now still have uh, the left the left size the o the only in the left size, but but now the the only in the left side develop the endometrioma around three centimeter. Mm -hmm. Three centimeter, but uh, she no pain. What, what what do you think, or what what about your plan about the the aspect of the the plan for the the pregnant in this case? So you mentioned that she she had, he, she had an ophorectomy before, right? Yeah, yeah. She she cut it off in the right size already, and then now just still in the left 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 size. And still and develop the you know metaoma also three centimeter now, and she for come sure, and mm -hmm. for sure I would go straight to IVF. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because we need to to gain time, and IVF uh -huh. recommended for the patient. And uh -huh. even if she cannot do IVF, for example, if she she cannot do it because of the price, because of the religion, because of whatever. Uh, I wouldn't do surgery for her. We need to mm -hmm. take care of the surgery. Imagine that if she has a bigger endometrioma in situations like this, mm -hmm. we, it's truly important for us to do a surgery. Remember that, imagine that she may have a, a seven centimeters, eight centimeters, right? What mm -hmm. we tend to do is if we recommend surgery, we treat the ovary with laser. Mm. It can be done with CO2 laser or diode laser as we do here in Sao Paulo. That is a tremendous laser. There is even now a blue laser that is outstanding for coagulation, vaporization and such. Mm -hmm. But if it's possible, I do the cryopreservation before. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is very, very nice. You, and then you may, you may ask me, oh, cryopreservation with anometrioma. Does it increase the risk of infection? It may increase, and this is why we tend to, to use cefoxetin for three days during the pickup. Of mm -hmm. the, of, but we insist, even with anometrioma, to try uh, a cryopreservation of eggs, of uh, oocytes or embryos. Yes, thank you. Okay, in, in this case, I, I go to, to the, uh, 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 do the ICSI for her the first time, and then I collect uh, the, the oocy around, uh, the mature oocy around six oocytes, and then I got two embryo. But, but uh, bad luck is all, all of embryo is uh, abnormal. I check the chromosome checking is all of embryo to abnormal. And then I try to do the second time of the ICSI. But my, my question is, is um, what do you think or do you think about, um, about the aspiration and watching about the endometrioma in the left hand side? Uh, I, I mean, it's, uh, I, I know the laser, I, I cannot do the laparoscopic, but uh, may I try uh, aspirate and then wash uh, by the water for wash the contents of the endometrioma? Is it held to the, the, the quality of eggs in the next time or, or anything? I, I don't know. I, I don't agree. I don't agree. I think that if you don't have laser, uh, if, if the endometrioma is less than four centimeters, mm -hmm. I wouldn't touch that endometrioma. Mm -hmm. If it has more than five, for example, I would... Uh, if I touch, I use laser. If I don't use laser, I will do the bipolar, right? I, I don't use alcohol, metrophrexide mm -hmm, mm -hmm. inside the over the cyst. But one thing that is very important, the presence of the big endometrioma, when there is a big endometrioma, we need to look for deep disease behind. Mm -hmm. And another thing that is very important, it's more important that treat the endometrioma is to treat the, the parametrium behind the endometrioma that sometimes is infiltrated by the disease 
And if you don't remove, you remove it and remove only the cyst, she's going to have another cyst. Mm. Thank you for your comment and suggestion. Well, Arik, how is thank you in Thai? In Thai? Thank you in Thai. Kitawi, you can send a patient to me because I have the CO2 laser in my hospital. Thank you, Dr. Lai. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for your time, Professor Abrao, and uh, we wish to uh, meet you face to face, even in Thailand or maybe in uh, Sao Paulo or who knows, maybe uh, any place in all over the world. As always, okay. I I I hope to to be able to do it soon, mm -hmm. and even uh, the the meeting of AGL this year will be virtual as well. Yes, and yes. It, it will be tremendous. It will be outstanding. So uh, I'm going to send you the the. Do you have WhatsApp, Olaric? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, of course. So send me by email your WhatsApp phone that I will send everything by WhatsApp. The okay. mix advertisement for you to circulate there and other places from Asia if you can, okay? Okay, sure, sure, sure. My pleasure. I will ask Tatiani to do it. I will send this to her that is helping me with the meeting. Okay, okay. Okay. So thank you very much. How many people attended this? Uh, I think for now it's around 10 and after this I will send the record to uh, Thai doctors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Very nice being with you. Okay. So uh, see you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.